Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. And today we're going to be continuing My Hero Academia The Dark Knight Returns. What if Deku was Batman? Season 2, Part 4. As always, if you're new to the channel or if you're a regular and like what we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is power core productions and podcastings that has to come out now and in the future where we last left off with our series despite things playing out a little bit differently than in the original story with eerie being rescued a lot sooner the shia saikai would not take it down easily while eerie was secured in a private facility held by the japanese police she would be taken away once again with Chisaki working alongside elite members of the Court of Owls, in particular Aoyama, who serves as the new leader of the group, the one branded Talon. Now the heroes must make a mad dash to get Iri back. However, things will not be easy for Izuku and company as they come face to face with some of the more darker sides of the criminal underworld, as well as a former comrade turned enemy. For all this and more, stay tuned as we now continue today's story. As always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. At the moment, Jinx was having her own trouble of conscience. As she sat around in the waiting area with a few members of the League of Villains, that being in Toga and Twice, still reeling from the death of Big Mag, there was also the likeliness of dealing with yet another darker aspect of the business, that being in the form of the girl. It didn't take long for Shigaraki to realize what they were getting involved in as he analyzed that quirk erasing bullet and even more so when they discovered the source behind it all some little girl it didn't sit right with Jinx what was happening to her she had only seen her once when they had brought her to the new facility she saw the look on the girl's face the look of defeat the depression, the sadness. And then she saw Chisaki walking closely behind her with his hand on her shoulder. It made her skin crawl. They all did. Toga would look to Jinx, wondering what was wrong. Jinx wouldn't answer, no. She had already stirred the boat more than enough. She just didn't really care anymore. Although Toga could seemingly figure it out. She didn't particularly like what was happening to the little girl either. Being used for a quirk and ostracized all the same. It would almost be hypocritical for her not to think so. While they were alone, while Twice was taking a nap, the two girls had a sore conversation. You can't think this is right, Toga. What they're doing to her. It's not like I do. But come on. In the end, it's a sacrifice, isn't it? How can you even say something like that? After everything we've been through, what you've been through. That poor little girl doesn't have anyone to look out for. And it's not like she dies or anything. You know, for someone who doesn't want to be a hero, you sure do like to play the hero. It's not about playing hero. I don't do this because I enjoy being a villain, you know that. Yeah, then why? Just for money? Cheap thrills? Not everything is about fighting a status quo, Toga. Damn it! We're talking about someone who's actually innocent. 
who didn't do anything wrong. Why does her life deserve to be messed up? She's not the only one that's innocent. A lot of us are innocent. It's not about us. Then what is? You know, if you have such a problem with everything, Jinx, you can always leave. No one's stopping you. Even though Toga said those words, she knew how untrue they were. Leaving the League of Villains was a lot easier said than done. And Jinx knew that she had too much to lose at the moment for everything to come crashing down like that. In the meantime, the heroes would begin their assault on the new hideout. Thankfully, they had the intel that they needed to make the strike. There wasn't any point in waiting or delaying any further. Izuku, along with key select heroes, would be the storm team on the inside, while others would wait on the out. Izuku charging in, behind the likes of Eraserhead, Mirio, Fat Gum, Sir Nai, Red Riot, aka Kirishima, along with the Green Arrow and the Black Canary, along with Jiro, as well as Dinky. All of them would go storming into the facility, taking the lead, with the likes of the foot soldiers of the Court of Owls still at play, and with key members of the Shie of Saikai. This battle was going to be a lot easier said than done. As the fighting would soon commence, Chisaki would now become irritated. He thought that with this hideout in particular, they'd have enough time. Just a way until they could find a new place to set up operations. But now it looked like they were going to have to be on the move yet again. The heroes would make their descent, following and battling against the likes of key members of the Chie Hasaikai, as well as members of the Talon Squad. Deep underground, Chisaki would be walking along with Talon and a few other henchmen of his own with the heroes closely encircling them. Melissa, who thankfully had arrived just in time, would also be joining the fray. Izuku, Mirio, and Melissa, all three of them spearheading their way to the underground, trying their best to get as close to Chisaki as possible. Thanks to some intel that Izuku had gotten from Bruce, he had learnt more about the Court of Owls. They had once been active during Bruce's time as Batman. However, there wasn't much known about the group. They were ones of immense power and wealth and they were always moving around. Not easy to pin. And it was even harder to find whoever their members could be. All the same though, as they continued on, Izuku could only be focused on one thing. Saving Eri and getting her back by any means. He had made a promise to that girl, a promise that wasn't going to be broken. Melissa and Mirio also felt the same. For Melissa, this was probably one of the most important operations she had ever been a part of so far. Hearing that girl's story, it drove her, it motivated her. It was why All Might and Gran Torino weren't going to stop her from going. They too were also shooken up by the horrific events that had been told to them. Any true hero would want to do anything in this moment to save and rescue by any and all means. Meanwhile, on the upper deck, inside of an open hall, a group of four in particular would find themselves surrounded by Talon soldiers, the Green Arrow and the Black Canary. Two older heroes, no longer in their prime, but still wanting to play a role in this rescue, along with their newly established young wards. The Archer and the Black Canary, both groups standing back to back, the young and the old. The Archers fighting from a distance, with the Canaries using their voice as a way of echoing attack along with their own versed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. What exactly did Jiro and Denki learn from the two great heroes? Well, for starters, when it came to Jiro, her quirk, along with Black Canary's quirks, were kind of similar in a way, 
at least when it pertained to the usage of sound. Of course, Jiro could not create an echoing sound with her screams, but that's what using specially made hero tools are for. Jiro wore a special collar around her neck, with a voice box and two ports connected to the box. She could attach her ear jack quirks that the lobes are from around her ears that took the form of ear jacks would connect to the box that was connected to her voice, amplifying her voice while negating the effects of it on her own self. With concentrated screams and with using her voice in different ways, she was able to mimic the powers of the Black Canary. However, it wasn't just this vocal power that was her advantage. She was also very adept in learning forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat. As for Denki, he learned that he could use his electricity in different ways, it, more than just being able to generate it. He could actually make constructs out of it. It took a lot of focus and a lot of practice, but eventually he was able to mold the lightning at his will. Unlike the Green Arrow, who was also quirkless and only fought with a bow and arrow, Dinky had a new advantage. For the most part, he had unlimited arrows. Now, sure, he could make anything out of his lightning constructs, but shooting off bolts of lightning? He was almost like a Zeus of sorts. Maybe he could incorporate that into his new hero name if he came up with one. The two archers stood back to back dealing with the soldiers that came their way. For those that got too close, the girls would step in also with a seismic scream that would send them reeling. The children had now come into their own. While still being far off and having ways to go, they showed that they had what it took, that they could step up when needed, and that their journeys were just getting started. In the meantime, the other heroes would have their own various fights, from Fat Gum and Red Riot dealing with two other members of the Sheha Saikai in Kendo Rapa and Hikiji Tengai, the one being known as the Ultimate Shield and as the Ultimate Spear, the battle of the two great wills with Rapa looking for a fight for someone that could push him and for Red Riot, being able to hold his own against a powerful force, buying Fat Gum the time he needed to convert all of his fat into his own power to break through the shield that was Tengai. In the meantime, Rocklock and Aizawa had to deal with other lackeys of the Shieha Saikai, as well as other foot soldiers of the Court of Owls, and one in particular being known as Mimic, who had the ability to morph into the walls, into the flooring of anything he was a part of. With Mr. Aizawa's quirk and with Rocklock working in combination, they were able to lock and hold him in place, stopping him from changing the terrain at will. In the meantime, Toga and Twice would now be making their move as well. And for Jinx, she had finally decided what she was going to do. Shigaraki had already left, and for her, that was good enough. She just hoped it wasn't too late. Meanwhile, deep underground, Chisuki continued walking, holding on to Eerie. It wasn't supposed to go like this. Honestly, these heroes, their never-ending nepotism... Their fake virtuousness. It's a disease. A disease that has to be cut off once and for all. But still, Talon would say to Overhaul, It is impressive that they were able to get this far. I must admit, the heroes are a lot more resourceful than we gave them credit. It makes no difference. Once we have what we need, everything can go according to plan. For your sake, I hope so. The boss isn't too keen on this being a failure, not with all the resources he's poured into it, into you. 
I'm very much aware. I have no intention on failing. I will earn my seat. The first one to arrive would be Lamillion, as he called out to the group, ordering them to let go of Eerie. So, it's a youngster trying to play hero. I don't have time for this. You can deal with him. Talon would then rush towards Lamillion, drawing his blade and striking at his waistline, hoping to dissect him in half. However, the sword passed right through, as Lamillion would return with a roundhouse kick that Talon would block with the sheath of his blade. Permeation, and you're pretty good with it. You're able to anticipate my kick. You're not bad yourself. Just then, sparks would begin to form all around them. Immediately, the walls would begin to fall and cave in. Electrical pipes and other things starting to burst every which way. It was almost like a string of bad luck had now befallen upon them. Chisaki was very aware of who it was as he rolled his eyes once again. What's the meaning of this, Jinx? What are you trying to do? You can hide in the shadows all you want. It's not going to make a difference. You having a guilty conscience? It's all finally starting to get to you? Well, I hate to break it to you, but trying to be virtuous right now isn't going to make a difference. It won't change everything that's happened. It won't change who you are. It won't change who your mother is. I know all about you. I know you better than you know yourself. Your mama used to be a criminal. Only problem is that she didn't have the heart for it. Then she got sick and fell on hard times. She tried to go straight. Tried to lead a normal life. And tell me. Where did that get her? It leaves her stuck in a hospital. She can't get a job because no one will hire her. And she's not strong enough to hang with this generation. She's a failure as a woman. A failure as a criminal. And a failure as a mother. And you? You're just a product of that failure. Shut up! I'm done, Chisaki. With you, Shigaraki... The League, all of you. Now let go of the girl. Now. Jinx stood at a distance with her arms raised, ready to anticipate. However, Chisuke would simply hold up his hand. His right-hand man, Sakaki, holding on to Eerie as he walked forward. His hands raised. He slowly stepped to Jinx. Well, you say you're done, right? Well, go on. Don't come any closer. What's the matter? I'm giving you an open shot. All you gotta do is take it. Come on. Take it. I said stay back. See? You're all talk. You don't have the heart. That's the difference between you and me. As Chisuke got closer, he reached out his hand. Jinx would fire off a blast of her energy, causing the ground to shake and stumble. However, Chisuke would touch the ground with his hand and stop it, reverting everything back to the way it used to be. You don't have it. You never did. But now, you're just a liability. And I can't have liabilities, now can I? He was preparing to reach towards Jinx, ready to destroy her once and for all. When suddenly, three batarangs would be thrown in his direction. He dodged two of them, but one managed to strike him in the side of the head, drawing some blood. At that moment, he would hear a cry. 
one for all. 15%. At that moment, a gusting wind would emerge. Melissa had thrown a kick, causing a great wind pressure to build between both Chisuki and Jinx. Batman, at least what the public knew of him, had now burst onto the scene. Immediately as Mirio was preparing to dodge another strike from the Talon, the Batman would emerge, blocking it with his bat gauntlets, holding on to the sword between the blades. Back up, Melissa. Get Eerie out of here. Yeah, but what about all handless? Just go. Right. Mirio would back up Melissa as Chisuke would turn. They saw that Jinx was there also. Do we have to fight her too? I'm not with them if that's what you're thinking. I'm not with you guys either. I just want to get the girl out of here and then be left alone. Mirio and Melissa would look at one another. Let's go with it for now. Our primary focus is stopping them and getting her out of here. If she's not going to get in our way, then we can use all the help we can get. Chisuke would then look towards Eerie, who was now cowering in the corner. The room now being sealed off. I hope you're watching, Eerie. All this death, it's on you. Chisuke readied himself to battle against the trio, while Batman had now come face to face with the Talon. So, we meet again. He leaned in to make sure that he was the only one that could hear. It's so nice to see you, Midoriya. Aoyama. He would kick back against him, the two readying themselves once more. I must say, I'm surprised that you were able to figure me out so easily. It wasn't hard once I saw the signs. But why? Why did you turn on us? What were you trying to... I was doing what I was meant to do. From the very beginning... I was sent to UA with one purpose, to find who was All Might's successor. And I ended up stumbling upon the successor of Batman also. If you know who I am, why didn't you sell me out? Because in some ways I respect you. I respect you enough not to give you up, but I will do what I must. It doesn't have to be this way. Why would you want to be a part of this? This is... This is... It's the way of the world, Midoriya. Everything isn't as black and white as you would want it to be. I was born into this. I was molded into this. This is all I've ever known. It's that simple. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's not about morals or ethics, anything of that nature. All of that goes out the window. Right now, I am simply the Talon. And you, you have taken the role of the Batman. You either strike me down or you die. It's that simple. I'm not going to kill you. then you will die. Talon and Batman would collide once more. As Chisuke raided himself, the three opposing him standing firm, Melissa channeling one for all, Mirio ready to strike with permeation, and Jinx covering their flanks. Along with Chisuke, his right-hand man was raiding his gun. The quirk erasing bullets. The underground battle was continuing to rage. The fight to save Eerie. 
beginning to enter into the next stages. Who would win? Who would come out victorious? That's something that only time will tell. This concludes My Hero Academia The Dark Knight Returns. What if Deku was Batman? Season 2, Part 4. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we continue and conclude High School DxD Fallen Hero. What if Issei was the Blue Beetle? Season 2, Part 4, the Season 2 Finale. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with PowerCore Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.